Morning everyone. Um, before we get going with the competition, it'd be really great if I could just run through a little bit of housekeeping with you all. This just makes sure that everyone is safe, everyone is comfortable, and also that we're COVID secure. So first of all, we're not planning on setting the building on fire. Um, however, if that does happen, all jokes aside, it is really important that we are very calm and we get up and we follow the stewards or anyone who is in a, a gray t-shirt to a fire escape. Um, this will be done in a really calm manner. However, as I said, we're not planning on a fire alarm. Um, so fingers crossed you won't need that piece of information. Secondly, um, obviously COVID numbers are now increasing. While the law um, on COVID and masks is personally up to choice, we are strongly recommending that when moving around the building, um, we use face coverings um, just to make sure that we're keeping everyone safe. However, this again is a personal choice. Um, it'd be really great if everyone could put their phones on silent. So you're more than welcome to use your phones, take lots of photos and share them on social media. We would absolutely love that. Um, you can also use the hashtag youth speaking comp and tag SGA youth ing um, as our youth social media channels. Finally, um, lunch will be provided and in the programs there is a rough outline of the day. So those programs are available via the QR code which will appear behind me at some point and also available in paper copy if you would like one. Finally, as I said before, well, that's my second finally, but um, there are stewards about and also our support team and they are all wearing grey Year of Youth t-shirts. So to talk about this event, this event is all about increasing youth opportunities. We know that our young people are fantastic and we need to be sharing that. This opportunity is an opportunity for all ages of cadets. So that ranges from 10 to 17. We're looking to increase our young people's confidence and give them transferable skills that they can take into their workplace and share with their communities. So in school, not all young people will have the opportunity to speak publicly. Public speaking is a very difficult skill because it's not something we're born with, it's something that we acquire. So giving our young people the toolkit to speak confidently and openly is a brilliant way to provide equity for them as they move on in their progression. So being prepared for work is one of the things that St John provides for us. When we think of St John Ambulance we often think of first aid. We're all here, we look like first aiders because we are first aiders but equally we're more than first aiders. I always say that yes first aid saves lives but kindness is what changes lives and our community that we've created in St John Ambulance is a community of kindness. We follow our heart values and we strive to ensure that our communities share our kindness so that our communities benefit from the things that St John Ambulance can provide. Here today, our wonderful young people will be sharing all of their passions with you. They are so passionate about ensuring their communities are safe, ensuring their communities are better and creating change. This is a platform for youth voice. It's a platform for values in action and our young people will be creating change as they talk to you. Hear what they say, they are masters in their field because they know what it's like to be a young person, they know what needs to happen, and they are a vehicle for change. Youth voice and values in action is something that's very dear to my heart. If we listen to our young people, they are the next generation. They are this generation because we are a community and we can all speak up to save lives. Now, I'd like to all invite you to join us in sharing how you can speak up to save lives via social media. So you can share how you can change things in your community. That might be becoming a dementia friend. That might be looking at how you can be environmental and sustainable. That might be going to a first aid course at your local St John Ambulance unit and doing a basic first aid session. All of these skills can come into play and all of these skills can support us in saving lives. So I'd also like to invite now the mentor team to come and join us. This programme has been a large programme of achievement and it couldn't have been done without our mentor team. <coughs> so our mentor team have supported our young people throughout the breadth of this competition from the regional round in November all the way up until today.
We will also continue to support them after this competition with additional opportunities that we can share. So I'd like to introduce you to Ellie May, who is the Regional Public Speaking Mentor for East. Phoebe, who is the Public Speaking Mentor for London and South. And Maddie, who has been the Public Speaking Mentor for North and West Region, alongside Fatima, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Um, so, together they have mentored our wonderful young people and other young people from across the country. And they'd like to share with you what they've done to support our young people's skills development. Okay. Hi, I'm Ellie May. Um, I'm the mentor for East Region. So, um, to start with the regional rounds that we've done to start this competition, um, Chloe put together a great system for it. We had judges from internally in St John and we had our external judge, which is Amber, for the Westminster Award. Um, so, it kind of rang similar to how we do the individual tasks for the national competition that you'll see later. The cadets had to submit a video to the, um, the email that we sent out and they spoke about a topic they were passionate about within health and social care and all of them came back and they were so inspiring and we were all like, whoa, this is way better than we were expecting, this is amazing. <laughs> and um, at that point they hadn't really had much mentoring by us either, which was like, our jobs are going to be far easier than we expected. <laughs> so it was really great. And um, from there, we'd done maybe a workshop with them to start with, to kind of introduce them to it, talk about how we need to promote youth voice more and things like that, and the basic skills for their first submission video for regional rounds. And they absolutely smashed it. And, you know, from that point onwards, every single cadet that sent in their video were amazing. And, you know, these guys are here now and they got to the national round, but every single one of them were incredible. So if you know anyone who did get involved in it, definitely speak to them because their topics and their videos were amazing. So following on from that, um, the national competitors were then selected as the highest scoring young people across the whole nation. So from each region, we have two young competitors who really shared their passion to us virtually, which is something that's really difficult to do because while technology is really immersive and really supportive and we've learned to use technology a lot more over COVID, it can also be a barrier because I know that I would much rather be sharing this moment with you all today in person. So from that, they then began mentoring online with their personal regional mentors. And Phoebe, would you like to share, or Maddie, um, <laughs> would you one. like to share what we did online and the workshops we provided? So we provided two workshops to our young people. So I think we can all agree that public speaking is a really, really broad subject. It's not just one thing. It's not just giving speeches. It can also be pictures, which is why today in this competition, you're not just going to be hearing from our young people through their individual speeches which are topics close to their hearts but also pictures on how we can make St John Ambulance a more inclusive first aid community. So our first workshop we did was on how to pitch. Not everyone knows how to pitch and I think actually something that was really special for us as mentors was we don't know everything about first not first aid, well, we don't, but <laughs> public speaking. And actually, we got to listen to other people and tips and advice that they had to really develop our own skills so we could help our mentees as best as we possibly could. So in our pitching, we taught them how to pitch, how to have a really engaging start, but also how to have a really engaging end. You can have role play, you can have rhetorical questions, you could have a call and response feedback. And we also watched some Dragon's Den because I don't think you can teach <laughs> without that. So we watched some really good Dragon's Den pictures and some which could have used a bit of improvement and actually getting the cadets to reflect on that for themselves to see what works best for them. Because obviously public speaking is a really personal thing. What works well for me might not work for Ellie or Phoebe <laughs> or Chloe. We then moved on to our individual speeches, which was led by the lovely Phoebe and Ellie. And they taught us how to structure our speech to make sure that we got all the information across. So tell them what you want to say, tell them, and then tell them again. So really getting your point across and making sure your audience understands what you want to hear. And from this, we mentored them on their individual speeches and their team tasks, so supporting them along this journey. So following that, we then arrived in London, which believe it or not, that's where we are today. Um, so yesterday, our young people joined us for a series of workshops that Phoebe is going to share with you um, and all of the things we got up to at York Street. Perfect. So yeah, when we got to York Street, we wanted to use the time 
to develop our young people even further, but also get them really excited about the opportunity that they have today. They're really passionate about the individual speeches and how they're pitching their team tasks to make our first aid kits more inclusive. So we wanted to work on that with them. Their passion is there. Um, we wanted to grow their confidence firstly. So our first workshop run by Chloe was Confidence 101. Um, and it was an incredible workshop focused around self-assurance and a growth mindset. So thinking about how you can improve upon things you've done. Um, but being confident in your passion and how you deliver things um, and how, what you take away from that. It even included some Just Dance to some One Direction and definitely was my <laughs> highlight of that workshop. Um, and then the next workshop which I ran was a Future Opportunities workshop alongside Ellie and Maddie um, because we know these young people are really passionate. They have some incredible ideas um, and we wanted to give them some steps and a toolkit of what to do next with their ideas. So we let them know about all the different opportunities there are out there for them as St John Cadets and in the wider, in the wider world. So we, we ended up with about over 20 opportunities, which is <laughs> pretty incredible. I think that speaks volumes of what St John provides for their young people. We had opportunities from a pinnacle of an opportunity going for the Sovereigns Award when they've collected all of their um, passions and their, the tasks that they've taken place in together um, over their cadet journey once they've achieved their Grand Prize Award to CVQO qualifications which will help recognise um, what they do in St John in a way that they can describe to employers through BTEC qualifications um, which can already be transferred from the work they do in St John to Duke of Edinburgh's Award which you can take part in St John um, and we love sharing these opportunities because <laughs> one thing we learned um, through delivering this workshop is we've all been involved in every single opportunity <laughs> at some point and that's probably why we're still here today. Um, it was a great opportunity because in the room we had experts in every single opportunity we were sharing with them and it was a great opportunity to collate that all together and share with them how they can share their passion down the road and in the future. This opportunity is all about growth and development. We want our young people to feel confident and self-assured. We want them to believe in themselves and we also want you to believe in them also. So as each young person delivers their speech, we would be really grateful if we could lightly clap or click in order to celebrate them um, as in accordance with some EDI um, as to not cause overstimulation. So we will now um, move over and start to introduce our regional round. So our regional round is all based off our young competitors working together to build together an inclusive first aid kit. Now, how many people here have recently opened up a first aid kit and looked inside? Who is aware of what is in a first aid kit? <laughs> <laughs> so in your first aid kit, you'll naturally find your bandages, a couple of plasters, um, hopefully a PRF form, um, some scissors and a lot of medical supplies. This is all about how we can add to our first aid kits to be more inclusive. What can we provide in a unique way in order to support key stakeholders, i.e. the people we treat and the people using the first aid kits. So each, young pe each of the young people when we were in workshops were given a list of items that they could share they were given a list of items that they could discuss at this pitch. So they will be pitching items from soft toys to iPads to fidget toys. Um, <coughs> headphones were also on the list um, because I personally think that might be essential to a first aid kit, but that's just me. Um, so they will be each be sharing their pitches. So as they come up, they will be joining together to build said inclusive first aid kit. So Maddie, um, if we leave you, we can introduce your young people as the North Youth competitors. Yes, so to start off our regional round, we have our lovely North competitors. So if you'd like to both come up and introduce yourselves. So we have been thinking about how we can make our first aid kits in St John more inclusive. And that could be environmental inclusivity, that could be the patients we treat, is it inclusive for the volunteers who are going to be using these items in our third aid kit? And our North competitors have been absolutely amazing. They have done so much research into their items to show you why they really think that these are going to make our first aid kits as inclusive as possible. And I really hope that you will join me to congratulate them on all that they have achieved throughout this competition. They have grown so much as individuals, they have developed skills so quickly 
like Chloe, Ellie and Dean started off, they were amazing at the start of this competition and we, know, we knew that it was going to be quite an easy job for us as mentors, but they've honestly exceeded all our expectations and we should be so, so proud of all of the young people we have here today because they are truly amazing and are going to shape the future of St John Ambulance. So a massive well done to both of you. I don't want to ruin anything that they're going to say because it is really, really good, but I will hand over to you both and Thanks. good luck. One in 12 people in the UK have a communication problem, and if they were involved in an accident and needed first aid, it would be hard to give them first aid when you can't communicate with them. This is why having an iPad in a first aid kit could be life-saving. Having an iPad in a first aid kit would help not only patients in St John, but also the members of St John. It could help the patients because if the patient speaks another language, we could use an iPad to translate what they are saying and what we are saying to them. Another reason why I could help patients in, is that if they are nervous or scared, it could calm them down. To calm them down, you could play a video for them, you could play music that they like, or you could even just let them fidget with it. Another way iPads could help is if the, sl if the first aider was slightly unsure on how to do something, all of the St. John iPads would have the St. John app downloaded so onto it so you could use that for a simple step-by-step -step guide for dealing with the problem. Research shows that iPads in a healthcare setting are becoming increasingly unpopular and useful. In the New York Methodist Hospital, staff use iPads as diagnostic aids in electrocardiogram systems and other systems. At Mass Massachusetts General Hospital, Clinicians use iPads to access up-to-date clinical information before and during patient consultations. Why would you put an iPad in a first aid kit when it could just run out of battery? This is because they are really useful and we can overcome this problem by charging them or just bringing a power pack with them just in case we need them. What about getting the iPad damaged? Well, we can buy cases and screen protectors for them. But what about the price of iPads, cases and screen protectors? We can buy them in bulk and that means you can get deals like 40 for the price of 30, meaning you save 25%. And, and this is the price and nothing compared to the price of if you damage an iPad. And buying screen protectors, if they got damaged, that would really help because getting an iPad damaged would be way worse. But why would we spend all this money on iPads for communication on when we could just use communication cards? This is because iPads are more than just for communication. They can be used as fidget and sensory toys, an MP3 player, communication cards and a mental health leaflet. This would help patients emotionally and overcome many communication problems. Here's how we could use an iPad as a first aid on duty with St John's Ambulance. Um, can, can you hear me? Uh, I'm checking for danger. Can you hear me? Da. All right, so this iPad can detect that he's speaking Romanian. I'm going to type in it. What is wrong with you? Mam lovit la genunchi. It says that he's grazed his knee. So I'll type in it. Can you lift your trouser up a bit so I can see your knee, please? Bine. So in this I can write, does this hurt? No. He says that it doesn't hurt, but I'm going to clean it. Bine. Okay, so I'm cleaning it, and I'm, I'm going to apply a dressing now. Bine. So I've applied the dressing. The iPad told me he was speaking Romanian, and this would help because there are over 300 languages spoken in London alone. Isn't that easier? Pop on in a second. So the judges are now going to be asking you a couple of questions about why you chose to pitch with an iPad. All right? Yeah. Are you ready? So first of all, this is Nikita. Hi. Yeah. So I'm Nikita. Um, have you been out on an event or in the unit when you realise actually this is not the best way of communicating, and an iPad might help you? Is that what spurred your idea? 
It was because, no, because um, we were given the choice of what to add to a first aid kit. And the iPad was the best because you could do everything else that all the other things could do on an iPad. And because it'll help because one in 12 people don't speak English properly in England. Thank you. Hi, I'm Georgina. Um, I was just wondering, going forward into the future, do you think that iPads should be put in more places than just a first aid kit? Yes, because they could be really useful in other settings, like schools or, say, shops or other places like that. Okay. Hi, I'm Mariam. I loved to hear your pitch. So sometimes technology doesn't always work. So let's say we're on a, an event in a fair, we're at a fun fair, summer fair, and there's no Wi-Fi, there's no signal. How would, you, how would your iPads work in that situation? Well, um, most people would usually have a phone. So um, maybe they could activate the hotspot on their phone and use it for the iPad. Okay, Ellie May, would you like to come and introduce your young people, um, Millie and Esme? be a mentor at all. They have made my life so easy. Um, I had a meeting with them at the start, kind of talking about, right, what do you want to do? These are the options. Let's let's weigh up what we want to do. We're given an option, so a few options, and I was like, right, let's weigh up what do you want to do. Um, the first choice were different, and then the second choice both matched. I won't tell you what it is, it will ruin the surprise, but I think it's great. Not being biased at all. Um, but, um, and yeah, they went away and we had this meeting and they went away and they literally planned the entire thing. And I had a meeting with them last week. I was like, right, how's it going? And they were like, yeah, we've done it. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, do you want to run through it? And they're like, yeah, sure. And they've done the entire thing. And I was like, I was like, whoa, like, you don't need me here. I was like, a bit sad, really. But um, no, they've done amazing. And I'm really, 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 like, it sounds like patronizing, but like, I'm really, really proud of them. And like, <laughs> I'm sure you are all aware what this year marked for the St John Ambulance community. The 100 years of youth has allowed the younger generation to voice their opinion on a variety of subjects. Today, Millie and I would like to share our thoughts about a more inclusive first aid kit. We believe soft toys would be a, necess a necessary addition in all kits for many reasons that we are going to explore. Soft toys are a symbol of safety and security for many people. We therefore feel they would help aid our patients as they can reduce stress and anxiety. I know that when I had an operation, I got really nervous. So when the anesthesiologist gave me a soft toy to help calm my nerves, it really helped and I want to give the same support and comfort to those within St John. Although you may think soft toys are just for children, adults can massively benefit from them too. Soft toys were used in the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, rollout program. This helped the adults who were worried about getting their injections. They can also be used with the elderly. Research shows that soft toys and dolls can help aid confusion and anxiety, meaning elderly people are more relaxed. This can help with people who are suffering from diseases such as dementia. Soft toys can also help aid communication, especially with people who have learning difficulties and additional needs. This is because the patient feels more relaxed, therefore allowing us to treat them better. We had the idea of using a Badger soft toy like this one and calling it Bertie, as this can offer more reassurance to our patients. Because Bertie, as a mascot of Badgers, knows first aid, this can be especially reassuring if the patient is a child. 
Soft toys also have multi-purposes, such as distracting a patient from their pain, their irritation or their injury. This could be useful with an agitated patient or someone who isn't good at the sight of blood. Soft toys can also be useful in helping to explain what you're going to do to a conscious patient. For example, you could wrap a bandage around a toy's arm or leg or apply a plaster on a corresponding body part to explain to the patient what you're going to do and how. This is particularly useful for people who prefer visual instructions. It may also help them to not feel alone in their situation. Soft toys are easy to come by and aren't expensive like iPads and MP3 players. This means the organisation can easily afford them and make them a critical part of the first aid care as we know it today. Soft toys come in a rainbow of different sizes, colours and shapes, meaning they can fit in all the different sizes of first aid care and are inclusive for all. Building on that, soft toys are extremely diverse. They are suitable for all ages, from zero onwards. All genders can use them, as there are so many vari variations like Millie has just discussed. They are also suitable for people with disabilities, as they provide sensory information and they are not harmful. Soft toys cannot discriminate. Due to their variety, if someone was allergic to the material or didn't like the feel of it, you could simply swap out the toy for a more suitable texture to suit the individual. Now we have explored the different ways soft toys like Bertie Badger will help <laughs> our patients by aiding communication and relaxing them, therefore allowing us to treat them better, helping to explain treatment to visual learners, and being so versatile they can help a multitude of different people in a variety of ways. Esme and I hope that we've helped break down the stereotype of soft toys only being for children. So we want to make our new first aid kit inclusive for all, marking the 100 years of youth in St John. Okay everyone, so thank you for that. I'm very interested in soft toys, I really like them. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Kevin who will have our first question for you about soft toys and inclusive first aid kits. That was fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, I wondered what uh, problems with soft toys you might have considered and one which came to mind for me was about kind of keeping them clean during first aid in incidents. How would you address that? So we know that if obviously you give a soft toy to a child, they're going to grow an attachment to this soft toy. So by taking it away from them, you're then kind of de, you're sort of making another problem to the problem we've already fixed. So we think by giving the soft toy to the child to take away, this can help obviously reduce this problem, meaning we don't have to clean them ourselves. And it also helps the patients more. Super, thank you. Thank you, that was great to hear your pitch. Would you provide any games or booklets to almost support how someone could use um, Bertie the Badger? And actually, if you did that, what's one thing you would tell them, advise them to do? Um, sorry, what was the question? Would you provide, let's say you provided some guidance on how to use or some tips. What's one tip you'd give to a first aid on how to use this effectively? Oh, I would make sure that you'd make sure the patient is familiar with the toy and make sure they can hold it a bit before you do anything. And then, as I said in my pitch, you, um, like put a plaster on him to show how you're going to do it or maybe let them have a go on him as you're doing it at the same time. Thank you. So I really loved your pitch. Um, I love the idea of a, a soft toy being in the first aid kit. So when it comes to the different examples of soft toys you were giving, you were talking about how you could have different um, sensory inputs and colours. So. This is a bit of a strange question, but if you had to choose one colour of Bertie Badger or one accessory to give to Bertie Badger, what would you give him? I'd give him like a little first aid kit. First aid kit? Oh. I think a first aid kit because then it kind of shows how Bertie knows first aid and that can further reassure the patients. Thank you. So thank you East Region. I'd now like to invite Phoebe to join us and to share all about how Duncan and Libin have been creating their pitch for their team park. Go for it, you'll be amazing. Have you got Bertie? Yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Nina. Um, I just wanted to let you know um, that I'm so proud of my own team to start with. Um, but introduce a little bit about their team path. You might notice that we've not got two of my competitors in the room. 
Um, you know what the woman was like at the moment? Of course, she throws some barriers and curveballs in our way. Um, of course, one of my competitors came down with COVID. Um, but he doesn't doesn't mean he wants, he wants to not compete. He has so much passion along with him. You can see in the conversation today. They're ready. I thought this was going to be curveballs. I thought this was panic them. Unfazed, completely unfazed. When we were planning the competition and planning their team task, they astounded me. A person made me set back and think about our first aid kit and how I can be more inclusive on duty. They made me set back and think about their passion. I think that those um, the two professors I have live in a dungeon. Their passion for our volunteers and the people we treat move mountains. They are so passionate about making things more accessible for our volunteers, but also the patients we treat every day. It's not about so many different aspects that I couldn't dream of thinking about, and they really do. can be used for patient welfare, but also for accessibility for our own event first aid crews. We think that iPads will be most best suited on the patient front for younger patients, especially those who are neurodivergent, because they are often familiar, easy to use, and, and provide a distraction from the noise of a typical treatment centre. The iPads will be most useful for those who feel overwhelmed by the bright colours and harsh lighting of a treatment area. While some may say that iPads are not suitable for older generations and may think they are not key stakeholders, they would be mistaken. Using an iPad can vastly improve their treatment. Using large font sizes and screen readers can help those in older age categories because peer apps and paperwork that we use for patients may not be easily readable for them. Another, <laughs> another key stakeholder could be our own event first aiders. Many volunteers are visually impaired and struggle to see writing clearly on a PR app. So an iPad could be a way of recording patient details moving forward, allowing them to feel better equipped to treat in our organisation. We propose that the iPads have a wide range of software on them, allowing for their best utilisation on duty. For first aiders, we would suggest that under a password protected folder, we should install electronic PR app software, the CFR Plus app, DIPS and Connect. For patients, however, we would see mindfulness apps, mental health leaflets, games and free music players rolled out to ensure that the welfare of our patients is best catered for. Now, there are many advantages of rolling out iPads into first aid posts. For example, they are very portable. Take the 10.2 inch iPad from 2021. It only weighs 487 grams. It would make very little difference to the weight taken on it. Furthermore, the iPads themselves are very clinically safe, being wipeable. Especially while they're in protected places. Meaning they can be used by multiple patients and first aiders, while still maintaining an IPC safe environment, keeping patients both safe and calm. This is especially important whilst they're still fighting the tail end of the dreadful COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, these iPads, if they're used, as previously mentioned by first aiders, can start to reduce St. John's carbon footprint. By reducing the number of paper PRS filled out, we can decrease our line reliance on natural resources. For reference, all PRF consists of two sheets of A3, which is roughly equal to a footprint of 29 grams per PRF. In comparison, 100 PRF. Libin, how many duties do you think um, 100 PRF is worth? Duncan, I think that's worth five duties worth of PRFs. It would be equivalent to burning one litre of petrol. We want to jump the gun on some of the questions you may have about implementing iPads in our first aid kits. 
So there are a few disadvantages with implementing iPads, the biggest being the price of them. A 2021 iPad would cost as much as £500 a piece, which is an enormous cost considering they'll have to be rolled out nationally. However, Apple offers discounts up to 10% for charities, which could help ease the financial burden of buying these devices. Furthermore, units could fundraise in the local community to help buy the iPads. Some may say that iPads can be broken easily. As many, of you will be, as many of you will be aware, dropping an expensive item can be an easy way to waste £200 on a new screen. I certainly know that dropping my phone is a big fear. On the same living, dropping my phone is definitely a huge fear of mine. Thankfully, protected cases can be sourced easily for relatively little money, allowing for us to protect our devices on duty. Unfortunately, some members of the public may wish to steal the iPads. Sadly, some do not care that we are a charity. Luckily, many events have lock boxes for paperwork where the iPad can be stored for when not in use. Also, our new first aid post vans have lockers in the back of them, allowing for electronic devices to be charged and safely stored while on duty. iPads will benefit every person who walks into our first aid post, whether that's the young, the old, those with disabilities, those scared, or those excited. All these groups can benefit from such a simple. So the question remains, why don't iPads already have a place in our wonderful first aid posts? Okay, Duncan and Livin. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you to Duncan for joining us, even though he is feeling a little bit poorly. So, I'm going to hand you over to Nikita, who will ask you your first question. First of all, well done for considering beyond the first aid kit, you considered the environment, well-being as well. Um, but my question to you is, what accessibility features would you utilise on the uh, iPad when filling out the forms? So we could use the screen reader settings and the enlargement settings for people who are visually impaired and also, we could also use um, the screen reader sorry, people who are, um, sorry, I'm trying to think, visually impaired and then we could use the different colours um, for people who may, who may have dyslexia or other neurodivergent problems. So I really enjoyed your speech, you had a good set of examples in there. My question for you is your final statement is why don't we have iPads? Why do you think we don't have iPads? So as mentioned in the pitch, um, iPads can be quite expensive and um, quite frankly we might not have enough money to roll them out nationally but I think through fundraising within our local units, I think it's definitely something that we can try, try to start implementing. Maybe um, district-wide or regional-wide first and then move on to a larger scale, so nationally. Thank you, Duncan and Libby, for a great presentation. Um, you mentioned how you'd have games on the iPad. Um, if you could only have one game, which game would it be and why? No, I think that there are lots of games that could be used, but I think something kind of retro like Snake could um, play to a large um, audience. I know certainly I'd enjoy Snake and uh, my parents and their parents would enjoy Snake as well. So thank you Duncan and Livin. Livin, you are welcome to take a seat. Duncan, you are most likely already seated. So. <laughs> Yes, so last but by definitely no means least, we have Akshita and Olivia, and they are our West Region competitors. Now, they have been absolutely incredible throughout this competition. They both knew exactly what they wanted to choose. They were really good at the start as well as weighing the pros and cons of all the items up. I made a slide, put all of them up. They had a brief discussion, pros and cons, and then go, yeah, this is definitely the one we're gonna do. This is what we're going for. And I was like, okay. They made my job so easy as a mentor. 
they worked so well as a team and that's definitely something I am so proud of as a mentor to see the teamwork that has come out of West Region. I've had other mentors and other people in this competition come up to me and comment on what an amazing team you two have been to each other, supporting one another throughout the competition and especially yesterday afternoon when it was quite difficult to juggle two regions, you supported each other with not only the team tasks but also your individual speeches and I think that's a massive credit to you both and kind of the inclusive atmosphere we've made here throughout this competition. So massive well done to you both. You're honestly amazing. I don't want to ruin what they're going to say because <laughs> it is really, really good. But well done to you both. I will leave you to it. I will be quiet. I know you've heard from me a lot today. But by Olivia and Akshita. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm a first aider. How can I help? Can you tell me what's happened, please? Where does it hurt? Can you tell me how much pain you're in, please, from zero being no pain at all to ten being the worst pain you've ever had? What about using these cards? Thanks. I'll get some help. Did you know that there are 3,239,447 people in the UK aged below 5, below the linguistic development milestone? Did you know 1 in 7 people are neurodivergent? Did you know that 49% of the foreign born population do not have English as a first language? This is why we believe that communication cards can overcome barriers such as age, language and underlying health conditions. So why do we not have them in our first aid kits? First of all, who do they help? Well, in one survey, 82.98% of patients agreed that using coloured communication cards helped them communicate with their healthcare professionals, thus showing that communication cards are a clear and straightforward visual tool for quite simply ease of communication. Because no matter what your roll bar says, clearer communication is fundamental for safe, effective and prompt medical care. But perhaps most importantly, they make our treatment more inclusive. They make every patient feel appreciated, listened to and valued. So what are the benefits? They are compact, portable and practical. These cards are very small and won't take up much space in our first aid kits. They won't add much weight either, so no need to worry about added back pain then. Also, they are much cheaper compared to other electronic alternatives, allowing us to invest in a more different range of cards to meet the needs of our diverse community. Also, they are very easy to understand and no technological barrier can block the way for our patients and first aiders. So, some of you may be wondering that in this era of modern technology, why not use an app? Wouldn't it be quicker? Well, we believe our St John's Ambulance team is diverse, especially in terms of age, ranging from adults like you to cadets like us and we should all be able to deliver the highest quality of clinical care, regardless of whether we have access to the latest technology or not. Another drawback could be limited vocabulary. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, there are 171,146 words in the English language. Surely we can't fit all of them in our first aid kits. This is why we would focus on high frequency words and medically relevant vocabulary. For example, our cards would show emotions, pain score, just like we demonstrated at the start, and key doodle icons. We would also carry around a, white a whiteboard and pen to allow the patients express their feelings through drawing, or modify our cards if they need. What about the trees, I hear you say? How could issuing a pack of communication cards in every first aid kit Possibly, possibly be environmentally friendly. Well, 
We believe that by using recycled paper or other long-lasting materials such as bamboo, we can reduce our negative impact on the environment. We can reduce the water, energy and chemicals in paper production and the cutting down of new trees, thus creating a sustainable, renewable product that also supports the work of St John's Ambulance's Environmental Steering Group. Now, when was the last time you spilt coffee on all of your work? Yes, accidents can happen all the time, which is why we think lamination for longer life is a great idea. Also, one short payment, our cards range from £5 to £10 per pack, is a small price to pay compared to the number of people it could help, the number of barriers it would overcome, the number of smiles we could put on faces, and not to mention the number of pounds we'd be saving by not choosing iPads. If every first aid kit in St John's had these communication cards, would it not be life-changing? Yes, they are eco-friendly, and yes, they are cost-effective. But perhaps most importantly, they help everyone feel more included. And surely that's what volunteering is about. So we ask you again, why do we not have them in our first aid kits? Thank you. So actually, to and Olivia, first of all, well done. Um, Thank you. It's a very big thing for all of our young competitors to get up in front of everyone and share what they would add to an inclusive first aid kit. So I'm going to hand you over to the judges who will share three questions with you again, all about your communication cards and why you feel they should be added to St. John Ambulance First Aid Kit. Uh, it's Kevin, and I really liked all of the facts and examples that you had there. Help me understand, is this something that we can just buy because it already exists, or is it something we're going to have to make and come up with for ourselves? I think it's a mixture of both. Um, for example, we mentioned high frequency words and um, for things like that, there's probably packs that already exist. But perhaps for the medically relevant vocabulary, you'd have to work directly with designers um, to choose what words would be most appropriate for the kit. Thank you. Thank you both for a great presentation. So you Thank mentioned you. medically relevant words or high frequency words. Could you give us a few examples, maybe three to five, of what these words could look like or be? Uh, this could show their feelings. So or they're feeling safe, if they're hungry, or if they need to go to the toilet for their needs. Um, they, those would be examples of uh, high frequency words. And for medical relevant vocabulary, say if they want bandages, that's what they feel needed, or they don't want bandages because you need to ask for consent, so our cards would cover them. As well as symptoms that we can't directly see. Sounds fantastic. Um, my final question for you is, if you had to have a colour for you, would you go for St John colours or would you go for colours representing the emotions? I think um, St John colours, for example, green, would be a great universal thing to add um, because we'd obviously want to branch out wider than emotions and it would help everyone, including first aiders ourselves, feel more included as part of a team. Thank you, Akshita and Olivia. If you Thank guys you. want to take your seats... So have you got cats with you? Yeah. Oh. Sorry. So you've heard all of our young people's Same pictures and they have all shared what they would add to an inclusive birthday kit. So just to recap, for North Region, Yarin and Robbie would add the iPad to their first aid kit. From East Region, Esme and Millie are adding some little Bertie soft toys into their pack. Lippin and Junten are also involving and adding the iPad to St. John Ambulance first aid kit. And Olivia and Akshita are adding communication cards. So each of our young people has really expressed why they feel it's important to have equity in first aid, why it's important to provide individuals with opportunities. I'd now like to invite our mentor team back to the stage to discuss the takeaway points of this task and how our young people have benefited not only from learning to kit, but also from exploring equity, diversity and inclusivity, or EDI, as a group.
how they've built together and what they've achieved as a complete cadet team. We're going to get the hang of these microphones by the end of the day, I do promise. Um, but for me personally, I think this task has been really important um, because these young people share passions, which you'll see later in their individual tasks in so many different fields of the health and social care sector. Um, but this has given them an opportunity to think about the future and more on the inclusivity side of things. So they can be passionate about lots of different things later, um, but taking forward in later life, your passion and thinking of that in an inclusive and diverse way so how it will impact everyone you might be passionate about a certain thing but how that will impact the people that you're trying to change um, how you can include them um, how you can share ideas with people they've had to take back take a step back and think about not only our event first aiders but the people we serve in the hearts of our communities um, and how the things in our first aid kits can make that more inclusive for them um, so yeah, they all have different passions and I think they, most of them entered the, the individual competition for the regional rounds with their passions for their individual topics and um, that's great, we want to share those passions through our workshops, we've given them an opportunity to talk about how they might take those passions forward but hopefully through this th first task they'll think about more being more equ equitive, I'm going to get the word right. <laughs> I stumble over my words a lot, and diverse um, when taking forward their passions. Um, so yeah, growing them in the future with that in mind, I think is really relevant and important for them. Yeah, I would definitely say probably one of the most inspiring things about all of these young people is they don't just think about short-term impacts. They think about the holistic impacts on everything. They think about the impacts on themselves, the impact of the young people around them, not just in their cadet units, but in their community around them. So the schools they go to, if they're homeschooled, their siblings, and they're all so passionate about everything. You can walk up to any one of them in our lunch break and you can ask them to talk about something they're passionate about and they will give you 120% no matter what. We're all a bit tired today, I admit, we went, a little bit late. we went to bed a little bit late last night, but all of them are so enthusiastic and passionate about their topics that they will still give you their all just to convey how important it means to them and why they think that actually we need to know about this. They want to make sure that we can be in, as inclusive as possible and we learn so much from these cadets just by listening to them and what they're passionate about. I think that's the great thing about St John and Chloe organising this competition is we're giving young people a platform to actually talk about things they're really passionate about and make sure that we, as young people, have a greater understanding of EDI. So I'm going home. <laughs> Hello. So, um, so I think following on from that, I think I think we've all kind of spoken to our teams and like the group as a whole, and I think it's really important that you guys know how important Youth Voice is, and I really hope you've seen how great that is today and how much of an impact these guys make, and you'll see it again later. But we kind of, as a mentor team and a support team, also kind of said we don't want our roles to stop now, and this is where the St John leaders in the room, we're now putting this responsibility onto you, so um, <laughs> sorry, a bit late notice. Um, but we want them, so we have seen how passionate these young people are about health and social care topics. And we think it's really important that we keep promoting Youth Voice. This isn't the end of it here. We're not just doing this competition that ends here. We want to carry it on. So we've got young people here who are interested in so many different things. And we want them to put them in contact with people who can help, they can have that discussion with, like, we don't. We want to put them in contact with them, but if they come to us and then we go to you, it's no longer youth voice. I mean, I would love to like. I'm still youth, you know, but you know, like you know, technically not, which is kind of sad. Um, I would have loved to be part of this competition as a competitor, but um, <laughs> but you know, and I think if if it's us coming to you guys, it's no longer youth voice, and it's so important that we want to connect our young people with you guys who are specialists in your field, in EDI, in clinical, in every single role in St John, because it's not just first aid and hashtag and so we want to carry that on and so we hope that you also take uh, help us take the next step with our young people to make sure that we can keep them progressing in this youth voice and keep it going and not just these guys but every single cadet forever and ever and ever and ever <laughs> so thank you
Yeah, the last thing I wanted to add is that um, I mentioned earlier that my uncle made me step back and think. <coughs> Next time I go on duty, even if I don't get an iPad in my first aid kit straight away, I'm going to step back and think how I communicate with my patients. And I think we can learn a lot from our young people today, but also on duties. They've clearly thought about the times they've been on duty and things that would help them. So please do spread the word that you can learn a lot from young people today, but on duties and on events. Uh, because we really have all stepped back and thought of things that we didn't think of. Um, so just bear that in mind and spread that message, as Ellie said. But thank you. Was I not switched on? Whoopsie. Um, so our young people up here are just a sample side of what St. John has. We have so many fantastic young people across the organisation and you can quite genuinely walk into any unit in Maidenhead and they will share with you what St. John has taught them. Personally, St. John has taught me team working skills, it's taught me public speaking abilities and it's taught me self-belief. A lot of the things that we do in St. John are to empower our young people. Our young people are growing and they're growing from the bottom. We give them all the tools that they need like little flowers. Um, and this is one of my favorite analogies for youth voice. So when you think of our young people, I want you to think of them as little flowers. And flowers don't grow because you pull from the top. They grow because you give them all the nutrients and they have soil and they are rooted in their communities. There's lots of things that support their growth. Now, a lot of people in the audience are thinking, wow, Chloe must be a gardener. Um, I really wish I was. Um, I've seen some blank faces in my flower bed. So <laughs> I think the message still remains that our young people are here to grow. Our young people are here to share, and they're here to support each other's growth. Now, we are running a little ahead of schedule, but I don't think anyone will complain if they get to have their sandwiches a little bit early. So if you'd like to join us um, in sharing with our young people and coming to discuss their topics with them, um, and then we will eventually have some sandwiches. Just a bad joke, sorry. <laughs>
everyone. I hope you've all had a lovely break. Um, I hope you're all feeling hydrated. Um, I don't know what the equivalent is, but not hungry anymore. Um, I hope you all got to the bowl of fruit pastels because they seem to have gone down the street. Um, so we are ready to start our individual tasks. And these individual tasks have been worked on by the young people for over two months now. See, our young people have such a wide range of lived experiences and such a wide range of passions that it's really valuable to us to hear what they have to say. They're talking about topics from physiological disorders to superbugs, back to learning disabilities and our whole um, inclusivity method. So our young people are really embodying our heart values and what they say, and they want to educate you about topics that they feel strongly about. We want our young people to be confident in what they give and to be confident in what they deliver, and they have had so many workshops to prepare them for this year. Each of the mentors will introduce their young people that they've worked with, um, to kind of share a little insight into their topics, um, and then we will give the floor to our young people who will share with you a short insight into their topic of teaching experience and a short insight into their unique approach. So first, I'd like to hand you all over to Ellie May, who has mentored Esme Adams as one of the chief inclusion initiatives. Ellie, do you want to share a little bit about her team? Hello. So um, the first person we have up is Esme. They've worked really hard on this and I think it's really great. It's definitely something that isn't spoken about enough. I really didn't know anything about it when she first told me, and I feel very educated on the back end. Um, I told her more to come. So um, I'll hand over to Esme. Imagine having to drop your pen in the middle of every sentence. Imagine having to look up every five seconds. Imagine having someone repeatedly whisper a word in your ear. That's what it can be like for people suffering from ticks. Over 300,000 children and adults are living with Tourette syndrome in the UK. So what is Tourette syndrome? I'm guessing a lot of you went to the idea of swearing and rude gestures, right? Well, according to the National Institute of Health, Tourette syndrome is defined as a neurological disorder characterised by sudden, repetitive, rapid and unwanted movements or vocal sounds called tics. But personally, I believe this definition is missing something. People with tics experience physical symptoms, such as the head jerks or humming, but many may also experience mental tics. These are like when you get part of a song stuck in your head or a piano key being struck over and over and over. But they are usually a word like a common vocal tick. No one else sees these as they are internal and they are hard to research as you can't gain any physical evidence or study them. The media usually show the funny side of Tourette's, not the full side. It can be funny, but that's not always the case. Personally, I would prefer you to laugh, so I know that you are comfortable with me ticking around you. Some people have to laugh to get through the harder parts that aren't always shown, such as the injuries, the medication, the getting into trouble, getting bullied, getting kicked out of school or university, or even a public place such as a restaurant. As I mentioned earlier, Tourette's isn't about swearing. The Tourette's Action website states that 90% of people with Tourette's syndrome do not have coprolalia, or in other words, involuntary swearing and obscene language. To be diagnosed with Tourette's, you have to have multiple motor tics and at least one vocal tic for over a year. There are other medical tests such as MRI, CT scans and blood tests that you may undergo on your diagnosis journey to rule out any other causes or conditions. Tics don't happen 24-7 and the severity of them can change over time. Stress, excitement, loud environments, 
lack of sleep, and many other factors can trigger ticks and increase their frequency and intensity. People don't mean what they tick, and they definitely don't tick what's on their mind. Ticks are random, even if they are contextual. For example, someone may see an ambulance to reenact a siren noise. There are quite a few comorbidities with Tourette's syndrome. By that, I mean Tourette's isn't always diagnosed alone. ADHD, OCD, anxiety, sleep problems, and anger can all be diagnosed alongside Tourette's. Tourette's is a lifelong condition, and some days are harder than others. So having a comorbidity on top of that must be extremely challenging. Plus, if you're not expecting more than one diagnosis, this could be quite traumatic or psychologically distressing. So do you think the media would find us funny now? Tourette's has no cure. There are different treatment options, such as behavioural therapies or medications that may reduce tic, tic symptoms. Some of the behavioural therapies include cognitive behavioural intervention for tics, exposure and response prevention and habit reversal therapy. If we focus on cognitive behavioural intervention for tics, which is the most common type of behavioural therapies used to treat tics, the aim of this is to make you comfortable with a premonitory urge, which is an uncomfortable sensation many people experience right before the tic happens. In one of these sessions, your therapist will establish one of your most common types of tics and aim for you to not do the tic by doing something else. Now I don't mean, instead of doing a head jerking tic, you're going to hold your head in place with both of your hands to, phys to physically suppress your tic. I mean something less obvious, such as gently tensing your neck so it's harder for you to do the tic. You'll do this multiple times until the urge for that tick to happen goes away. And as a result, you won't do the tick as often as you used to. Some of the medications that are used to treat Tourette's uh, include drugs used to treat ADHD, such as Ritalin, drugs used to treat OCD, such as SSRIs, and antipsychotic drugs, such as Haloperidol. These all aim to reduce tick symptoms and make ticks more manageable on a daily basis. Some people may choose to not take medication to treat their tics, either because their tics aren't that severe or because of the side effects. The side effects depend on which drug you take, but most of them aren't very nice and some are quite severe. For example, depression is quite a common side effect of these drugs and depression is a debilitating condition alone, yet paired with Tourette's? I can't even imagine. Some people will try to suppress their tics, especially in public or at school, but this is not recommended. Suppressing ticks can be more harmful than letting the tick out, as the urge build up and get stronger. I, of I often get asked, what does it feel like to suppress your ticks? And I say, okay, imagine you really, really want to sneeze, and someone says you can't do that. You try and hold it in, you notice that the urge gets stronger and it feels uncomfortable. Your face might start to tense up, or you end up pulling a funny face as a result, but you can't. So you let it out, the feeling goes away, and you get a sense of relief until the next one. Thank you, Esme. I think that was a really insightful look at Tourette syndrome and tick stigma. So I would now like to invite Phoebe to join us. Phoebe has mentored Libin and Libin um, will be discussing... Sorry, <laughs> Libin will be discussing um, domestic abuse. Um, Phoebe will share more about his topic before he reaches you on the stage.
Imagine being trapped. Trapped in a repetitive cycle. Then imagine that cycle being the cycle of abuse. How would you feel? Let me try my best to demonstrate this for you. Take this box and imagine it to be your home. The place where you feel most comfortable, your safe space. And this is the key to your home, your way to leave. At first, it may seem so easy to just take the key and walk out, but it's so much harder when the key is out of your reach. Essentially, domestic abuse is any form of threatening behaviour, violence or abuse, including psychological, physical, mental or emotional forms of abuse between adults or in younger relations, regardless of gender or sexuality. Abuse often starts with tension building. This is when abusive partners lash out in response to, exter in response to external stress factors, so trouble at work or family issues. During this stage, victims tend to feel anxious and feel the need to placate the abuser. Then the abuser eventually tries to release this tension by trying to establish power through various forms of abuse. After the incident of abuse, the abuser tries apologising or even denies any, forms, any form of abuse. Sometimes they even try to blame the victim to avoid responsibility. This is known as the stage of reconciliation. Then the abuser moves onto the honeymoon or calm phase where the incident is forgotten, no abuse happens, and the, ab and the abuser often uses kindness and gifts to move past the abuse. In other words, this is known as the cycle of abuse. In abusive relationships, this cycle repeats over time, over and over and over. How would you feel knowing that this is all likely to happen again and again and again? Let me tell you the story of James Harrison, a 25 year old writer from New York who thought he met the love of his life, who then became his wife and then his abuser, Amy. Not even a month after they had met, the, eight, the couple became an official Facebook couple. Six months later, Amy was sacked from her job and then evicted from her apartment. James decided to help her out by inviting, by inviting her to stay at his apartment for as long as she wanted. Little did, little did he know he was inviting abuse into his home for the next six months, both physically as well as mentally. It all started with verbal assaults, which he thought were harmless since he wasn't being physically attacked, so that wasn't abuse, right? Just words, nothing more. James was wrong. Slowly, verbal assaults turned to fists, and just a month ago, James was rushed to A&E. When asked why he didn't speak up sooner, James said it was because he was ashamed. I couldn't even tell my roommate, he said. I was so ashamed of myself and having to ask for help. James's story is just one of many, some out in the public eye, some not talked about by the victims themselves. Every victim will have a unique story and every victim deserves justice. James's story also demonstrates to us that it's not just women that experience domestic abuse, it's those who identify as male too. Domestic abuse applies to all in society. Statistics show that domestic cases, domestic violence cases are increasing every year. In 2018, 700,000 cases of domestic abuse were reported, and it's scary to think that only 100,000 of those cases went to trial, and even harder to accept that only 25,000 abusers gained a conviction. This demonstrates why, why so many victims decide to put off reporting domestic abuse, as unfortunately the likelihood of them receiving justice is unfortunately very low, and this is something we must advocate to change. Did you know that shockingly, each year, one in four women and one in six men will experience domestic abuse? How does this make you feel? So let's apply this to a St John Ambulance duty. If you see something on duty that makes you suspect that somebody is experiencing domestic abuse, you should approach them and ask them if they need any support and point them in the right direction to support services. So for example, the National Domestic Abuse Helpline or Mankind. 
If you think they're in immediate danger, you must call the police. We should look out for signs of abuse in our day-to-day -day roles to protect the amazing people in our St. John family and those that we care for. There are so many signs of domestic abuse that we should be on the lookout for. For example, some include loss of self-confidence or self-esteem, wearing long sleeves in extremely warm weather, although this could be for medical or religious reasons, or being jumpier and more on guard. People often ask, why don't victims just leave? Often the path to leaving isn't as clear as it may look. Victims often feel that the fear of leaving is greater than the fear of staying. The fear of the unknown can be a powerful reason for staying put. Also, victims are often threatened with physical violence, th physical harm if they try to leave, clearly demonstrated by the statistics. A strong support network is so incredibly important for victims when they are going through such a mentally draining time. An unsupported friends and family may make it harder for victims to feel as if they can leave. Knowledge of, the, knowledge of the difficulties of single parenting and reduced financial circumstances may factor into their decision to put up with abuse. So the path to freedom isn't always as easy as it seems, and finding that key to escape is truly a challenging obstacle. So what can you do to help those suffering from domestic abuse? If you know somebody that is experiencing domestic abuse, it's so, much, it's so important than ever that you let them know that they are not on their own and that you will be there every step of the way to support, comfort and advocate for them as much as they would like and be there if they choose to report it. Whether you're friend, family or even colleague, be there when you need to be the most. Domestic violence is a silent killer. So will you be the person that helps victims reach for that key to freedom. Thank you, Livin, for that brilliant insight into domestic abuse, but also what we can do to support victims of domestic, domestic abuse. We're aware of what to do in those situations and how we can support them. I'm now going to hand over back to Ellie May to introduce her second competitor, Millie, who will be discussing learning difficulties and disabilities and how we can implement support structures into education. So over to you, Ellie May. Hello. So um, I would now like to introduce you to Millie. She has worked really hard on this presentation, like everyone else. But, um, yeah, it's definitely something I think Millie will agree that it's spoken about, but I think it's actually quite shocking how many people this affects. And um, yeah, it's definitely really interesting. It's definitely made me think a lot more about the way that when I'm talking to young people or anyone really, how I approach that. So yeah, I'll go to Millie. How can we help students with dyslexia succeed in education? If I was to ask you about dyslexia, could you tell me about it? Could you tell me what it is or how it affects people? The word dyslexia is from Greek and is made up of two different parts, dys meaning bad or difficulty and lexia meaning word. So dyslexia literally means difficulty with words. In, a, in 2018, the NHS defined dyslexia as a common learning difficulty that can cause problems with reading, writing and spelling. More recent research by Made by Dyslexia in 2021 shows it can also affect a person's ability to concentrate and to memorise information. The condition is thought to be genetic and therefore passed on through families. So if your parents, grandparents or siblings have it, there is a chance you may too. Some people can acquire it later in life from traumatic brain injuries. Re research in an article of Reading Rockets suggests that dyslexic brains are non-neurotypical, meaning they're wired slightly differently. This means that dyslexic people have a different way of thinking and processing information. As I said before, 
Dyslexia is a learning difficulty, which means it doesn't affect a person's intelligence. Instead, it makes them excellent at solving problems and puzzles and good at using their imagination. Have you ever wondered how many people have dyslexia? It's more common than you might think. NHS figures from 2018 suggest that one in 10 people in the UK will suffer from dyslexia. But other more recent research by Made by Dyslexia suggests this figure could be as high as one in five. I've been told there are approximately 50 people in this room. That means that 10 of us will have dyslexia. So what, how can we help students who may have dyslexia help their teachers and themselves to recognise it? Because in a school class, there are around 30 people. This means six of them may be suffering from dyslexia. We should educate teachers on the symptoms of dyslexia, such as reading and writing slowly, confusing letter order in words, poor and inconsistent spelling, understanding verbal explanations rather than written ones, finding sequences of directions hard to follow, but more positively, as I mentioned earlier, thinking in a more 3D way and having a better overview of problems. Even though most dyslexic people will display the symptoms I just listed, there are four main types of dyslexia. Phonological dyslexia, which is extreme difficulty reading as a result of a phonological impairment, which means they struggle to manipulate the basic sounds of language. Rapid naming deficit, which is difficulty quickly naming things such as numbers, letters, and colors on sight. It can also take a person longer to name things in a row. Double deficit, which is both rapid naming and phonological impairments that can cause reading problems. Individuals who suffer from this particular type of dyslexia are more prone to struggling. And finally, surface dyslexia, also known as visual dyslexia, which is difficulty with whole word recognition and spelling. Even people who suffer from the same type of dyslexia will have a unique set of challenges and strengths. For example, nine in 10 people with dyslexia struggle with grammar and spelling, but are amazing writers. And seven in 10 people really struggle to learn their times tables, but are brilliant at maths. Treatments differ between ages. Primary school children are more likely to get extra English lessons to improve their spelling and grammar, whereas secondary school pupils are more likely to get extra time on exams and assessments. This can help them complete their papers, but it can also cause problems such as embarrassment, low self-esteem, and lead them to be more self-conscious as they're being singled out from their peers. So this isn't always the best solution. Others use laptops and tablets instead of writing in class. This can be really helpful, especially when people are shown functions such as changing the background colour on text. This means that students can read information better. Students can also benefit from coloured books or overlays. The most common colours are blue and yellow. Sadly, around 80% of children will leave education without a diagnosis, making this a massive barrier for success, not just in education, but for in the workplace. It also has a detrimental effect on a person's self-esteem. I can't stress enough how life-changing getting a diagnosis can be. I know someone who was told by their school that their dyslexia was just bad spelling. So when they got their diagnosis, it completely changed the world of education for them. We need to raise more awareness in schools, especially for teachers, so dyslexia for their pupils can be recognised more. So what can teachers and students do to help themselves or their pupils with possible or diagnosed dyslexia? Teachers. You should never ask someone with dyslexia to try harder. They already have to try so much harder than everyone else. Instead, adapt your teaching style to suit them. Using dyslexia-friendly fonts such as Comic Sans and Arial can help a dyslexic student read information on PowerPoints better. Using single colour backgrounds rather than pictures and patterns, as this can help them to focus on the information needed. Spacing out information can also make it easier for reading. If needed, print out worksheets in the colour they were given on their colour screening. You can also talk to the school's special educational needs coordinator to try and arrange a test if you suspect a student may be suffering from dyslexia. Students, you can find a coping strategy that works for you. You should view your dyslexia as a superpower rather than a barrier. Be open with your friends, family and teachers because it's okay to admit that you're struggling. And you have positives, not just challenges. So embrace them and work around the problems. 
We should all encourage anyone we know who may be suffering from dyslexia to get a test. Although private tests do cost around £500, they can be life-changing. Although they aren't cheap for schools either, as the money has to come from their own budget, they can buy packages which allow them to test a certain amount of students per year. This is helping to make tests more accessible for those who can't afford them. Schools can also perform initial screenings to see if someone may have dyslexia. The screenings cover a variety of topics, such as reading, writing, spelling and maths, to test for all the different types of dyslexia I mentioned earlier. We can also do colour screenings, which help reduce visual stress. These reduce visual symptoms such as letters moving around or words shuffling on the page. An article in the Brain Sciences Journal in 2021 suggests that the most effective coloured overlays are turquoise and yellow, as can, these can help reduce the amount of time dyslexic readers spend on ind individual words and sentences. We should also promote the use of role models, so pe dyslexic sufferers know they aren't alone. Three famous dyslexics include Albert Einstein, one of the world's greatest scientists, Jamie Oliver, a chef, cookbook author and restaurateur, Holly Willoughby, a TV presenter, model and author. These are only a few of the dyslexic celebrities. There are so many more, such as Keira Knightley, Orlando Bloom and Her Royal Highness Princess Beatrice. So could you tell me more about dyslexia now? I hope you could. And if you're ever struggling, think about what Joe Malone once said. My dyslexia is not a disability, but an ability to think differently. And if the world needs anything at this moment, it's people who think differently. Oh no, I fix this one, never mind. I keep saying that we'll get used to these microphones. I really think that might be a big fib. Um, so, I'd now like to introduce you to Maddie, who will be sharing what Yaren has been doing for his individual speech task. Now, as I said, our competitors have been working on these tasks for a very long time, and it's very encouraging to see all that they've developed. So over to Maddie to discuss Yaren's topic, for his task. Good afternoon, everyone. So, up first from North Region, we have Yayan, who is going to be giving us his speech on head injuries and traumatic brain injuries. This is a topic that Yayan is really, really passionate about, and I know he's really excited to share that with us all today. So, Yayan, would you like to come to the top? And yes, I hope you enjoy listening. It's very, very interesting. Head injuries. You've probably heard of them, but do you know what they are? A head injury is a broad term that describes a vast array of injuries occurring to the scalp, skull, brain, underlying tissue and blood vessels in the head. But I'm going to focus on injuries to the brain and the brain tissue. There are two types of brain injuries, a traumatic brain injury and a non-traumatic acquired brain injury. Around 1.7 million people have a traumatic brain injury every year. A traumatic brain injury, also known as a TBI, is a sudden injury causing damage to the brain. These usually occur when there is a blow, bump or jolt to the head. Many common scenarios when these can happen is during boxing, fights, rugby tackling, car crashes and even just heading the ball in football. A non-traumatic acquired brain injury also known as an ABI, is an injury to the brain not caused by an external force to the head. These usually are caused by illnesses, oxygen deprivations, metabolic disorders, aneurysms and cardiac arrest. There are two ways a head can get injured, directly or indirectly. A direct head injury, also known as a primary head injury, is an injury to the head at sight of impact on the head. These are much more obvious to spot, whereas an indirect head injury would need more observations. Signs of a direct head injury are bruising, swelling of the head, damage to the skin or fractures to the skull or scalp. An indirect head injury is when the head has been hit and the brain has bounced to the other side of the head, causing that part of the brain to get injured. This can lead to concussion and damage to the brain tissue. 
Now, how do we treat and manage a brain injury? The ultimate management is hospital care, but this is what you can do as a first aider. If there is a wound, clean it, then apply a dressing. If the casualty is feeling sick, give them something to vomit into. If the casualty is unconscious, do Dr. ABC, which stands for danger, response, airways, breathing, and circulation. And if everything is fine except from the casualty's response, put them in the recovery position as they're at risk of being sick. If the casualty is conscious, monitor their consciousness with the AVPU scale. In this, the A stands for alert, the V stands for verbal, the P stands for pain, and the U stands for unresponsive. First, you should check their response to questions and if their eyes stay open. Then check if they can follow simple commands. To check for pain, pinch their earlobe and see if they respond to that. And the last stage is being unresponsive. Next, I'm going to talk about the after effects and recovery of a brain injury. There are two ways to categorize the after effects. One group being the early and the other being the delayed. The early effects cover loss of balance, nausea, persistent neck pain, ringing in the ears, and sensitivity to light and or sound. The delayed effects cover blurred vision, loss of balance, difficulty concentrating, depression, fatigue, personality change, and memory loss. The recovery can involve learning basic things again, such as feeding, walking, reading, writing, and speaking. Just to give you a personal view, I once suffered from a head injury. I was doing judo when I was thrown across the room many times and ended up with a concussion. I had to be taken to hospital for observations, but I didn't need a head scan because it was classed as a minor head injury. My symptoms were vomiting, fatigue, lack of concentration and incoherence. My symptoms lasted a few months. My recovery also lasted a few months and in this, I had to rebuild my stamina. Because of the fatigue, I struggled to keep mobile and walk for short periods of time. To conclude, a head injury is an injury to the head and or brain. The symptoms are fatigue, vomiting, lack of balance, blurred vision and memory loss. You now know the meaning of a head injury, the symptoms and how to treat one. And from my own experience, you can see that even a mild injury can have a long recovery. Thank you, Yaim, for that wonderful insight into head injuries. Head injuries aren't actually something I'm that familiar with or have treated that many times, so I will definitely carry some of that new knowledge forward. We are now going to hand you back over to Maddie, who will be introducing Robbie, and his speech is all about growth and development. Maddie, do you just want to mic off me? <laughs> right, so hello. We now have our other north competitor who is robbie he's going to talk to us all about being unique and being ourselves so linking back to the quality diversity and inclusivity we were talking about earlier this is something robbie is really really passionate about and you're going to see that to these cadets as you've probably seen from some of their talks already they're really really passionate and they know lots of things that we don't know at all and this is amazing i think it's an amazing learning opportunity for us today to learn about things they're really passionate about and what we can carry forwards so I know Robbie's been working really, really hard on his speech, so I'm going to hand it over to him to talk all about being unique, being ourselves, and why we should be really, really proud of that. Yes, please. There we are. Ready to go. Superstar. Hi everyone. My name is Robert. I'm 10 years old and I am unique. Is anybody else unique here? I mean, we all sleep, we all have two eyes and we all like pancakes. So we are all quite similar, aren't we? But some of us like pancakes with Nutella, some with sugar and lemon and some with jam. Well, I like all three options to be honest. 
My point is that we all came into this world with a unique combination of talents, abilities, passions, capacities and skills and we should use them as tools to help us reach our full potential. Unfortunately, many times we cannot express these gifts as they are not being identified and because schools teach us the same things at the same age, as if we were all identical. Studies say that we only use 2% of our brains and it's no wonder considering that schools just take a curriculum and stuff it into a child instead of taking a child and building a curriculum around them, around their talents and needs. Let's take an example. Einstein. You all know Einstein, don't you? Einstein started to speak at four years old. If Einstein was a child today, he would be identified with autism spectrum disorder or intellectual disability. The thing is that his brain was a lot faster than his capacity to express what was happening in his brain. That's it. Did this need a name? And if it did, why did it have to be a bad one? I mean, Autism spectrum disorder? Intellectual disability? Why, if we don't fit into a standard category, it means we are having a problem? If so, each child should be a category. And guess what? Today, we have Einstein syndrome. So, we have a syndrome for kids who think without speaking, but we don't have a name for people who speak without thinking. <laughs> So, we can't all be very good at everything, but we are all exceptional at something. And if we don't develop those areas that we are good at, then we will always be average. By the way, I started to speak when I was three years old, and now I can't stop talking. <laughs> but even if I wasn't speaking, I learned alphabet at two, and when I was five, I was reading high school level chemistry books, I knew times table, and I was reading Harry Potter. And I was depressed. I was bored in school and I had no kids and I had no friends to talk to. I needed kids who I could talk to about black holes, law of attraction, robots, if I could make trees grow faster, or if my body was weighing more or less on Saturn. But I had to learn letters instead. <laughs> my, um, I became bored in school. I was crying every day and I was living in a world that wasn't mine, a world of stereotypes and limits. Why limits? Well, the curriculum is too general. It doesn't care if a child has musical intelligence, and that is a limit. It doesn't care if a child is a good negotiator, and that is a limit. It didn't care that I could learn alphabet at two. No, I would have learned alphabet at five, according to the curriculum. And that, my friends, is a limit. So, as I wasn't using my time properly, or my talents, or my potential, my parents decided to take me out of school, and I was homeschooled for three years. It was a hard decision for my parents, as they had this preconception that learning equals school. But I learned how to learn in a different way, in my own rhythm, using my talents, and being happy at the same time. While I was homeschooled, I dedicated a lot of time to coding, chemistry, experiments and inventics, but also to playing, camping and travelling. I have inventions that have won international awards at invention conventions from UK, China and America. Me and my brother got £40,000 from Dragon's Den in Romania to open an, a shop with our inventions. I became a UK World Educational Robotics Gold Medalist and I represented UK at the World Educational Robotics Competition in Shanghai, China. I never would have had these results if I had to spend the first most effective hours of the day being bored in school. I also studied Year 10 Chemistry, getting ready to pass GCSE next year. But I'm not ahead in writing on the contrary. I'm anything but artistic and you don't want to hear me singing or see me dancing. <laughs> Some things I'm just not good at. We can't be good at everything. But the point is that I discovered my talents and I'm using them to reach my full potential. Other kids around me are exceptional in drawing and could become great architects. Others have an exceptional dexterity and could become great surgeons. 
Others are talented in areas we never even thought that they are talents. Being a good businessman is a talent. Being a good listener is a talent. Being a good parent is a talent. Being a good negotiator or public speaker is a talent. But if no one discovers these gifts, they will not serve their purpose. To make these kids exceptional in what they are gifted and to help them fulfil the mission that they were destined for. Some kids may never even be aware of their gifts or may not know what to do with them. That's what school should be all about, discovering and nurturing our potential and creating a unique context for our learning, not creating the context and then forcing the child to fit in, as this, again, is a limit. How many adults have discovered their talents only after they already had a career and it was too late to change it? How many adults have a job they don't like and dream they had a different one? We spend one third of our lives working. One third. Who wants to spend one third of their lives doing something they don't really like doing? Statistics show that 59% of people consider a career change and 29% of people manage to completely change fields. 59%. Many kids in schools are learning because they have to, not because they like it. Therefore, they'll forget 85% of everything they learn, studies say. They learn for tests to have a well-paid job, but not for their souls. Now, the 59% makes more sense. My speech today is a call to use more than 2% of our brains. A call to reduce the 59% of people who consider a career change. A call to treat and educate each child from an early age in a unique way and to make them exceptional. This way, exceptional will become normal and it will be normal to be exceptional. I was a late speaker, my singing hurts my ears and I better build a rocket than dance. But I'm brilliant in coding, chemistry and robotics. What were you late at and what are you brilliant at instead? No matter the answer, you are unique. So be yourself and be different. Thank you, Robbie. That was very insightful and very encouraging. I definitely know that I now feel a lot more unique and a lot more special and celebrated from your speech. So I'm now going to introduce you to Phoebe and her second participant, national finalist, competitor, whichever word you'd like to use, Duncan. Now, Duncan is currently at home as he's poorly, but he's been very resilient and he has um, recorded his clip when he was a little bit more well so that we can play it to you all. Um, he's put a lot of effort into this clip and he's really disappointed not to be here, understandably. <laughs> but I think it's really important that we celebrate him just the same. So I'm going to hand you over to Phoebe <coughs> and she's going to talk a little bit about Duncan's topic because I know it's much too technical for me. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Um, yeah, I know Duncan's really gutted not to be here, but I think he'll still get his incredible message across. I learned... I've learned from everyone, but I learned a lot more science than I've ever learned at school um, and the future of antibiotic resistance from Duncan and the way he puts it across. Um, I was never, you know, top, top of the class at science, but I got it the minute he put it across in the way he's going to put it across to you. Um, and it really excites me and I hope it excites you just as much. It's December 2019. The world is heading unknowingly into one of the worst pandemics that we have ever seen. Yet a silent killer already has begun its killing spree on our globe. 1.2 million people dead. By 2050, this could kill more than cancer. How, you might ask? A rise in the use of antibiotics has caused an increased resistance to them, once treatable bacteria, now incurable. Unless we act now, we could face another pandemic as minor bacterial infections become untreatable. I'm sure that many of you know what antibiotics are, and many of you have taken them at some point in your lives, but what do they really do? Antibiotics are a form of drug that affect the cell processes of a bacterial cell. For example, some prevent the reproduction of the cells, some prevent the production of proteins in the cells, and some break down the cell walls. 
So how can the drugs be reducing an efficiency then, if antibiotics have been functioning for so long? The answer, worryingly easily. The overprescription of the drugs means that more drugs are given to minor infections and to patients where the drugs simply aren't necessary. Upon introducing the antibiotics into population, there is a fight for survival of the pathogens, meaning that only those with the highest resistance can survive. Lots of patients then feel better, finish the course early, and leave the drugs in a drawer somewhere. Forgotten. The few bacteria that are left then reproduce, passing on their resistant genes to the next population. In a very short period of time, this process can repeat until all the bacteria in the resultant population are resistant. While this may seem like new information to you, we've known about antibiotic resistance since the 1950s. Only now are we realising the damaging prospects of this all too real danger. Now that we've established the cause of our public health powder keg, the study of MRSA, a so-called superbug, can provide some stark statistics that are vital in our fight for the next global threat. An average of 800 cases of MRSA each year have been recorded in Britain. Thankfully, case rates have stabilised due to increased hygiene in hospitals, meaning it is less likely to be transmitted within treatment areas. Furthermore, this bacterium is treatable by vancomycin, a drug that inhibits the production of bacterial cell walls. However, a new variant of MRSA, known as VRSA, has been discovered. Being resistant to vancomycin, could it foreshadow what is to come in an era of antibiotic resistant bacteria? Thankfully, our future is not set in stone. There is a way for us to free ourselves from this disease ridden dystopia. There is a major effort to redevelop an old treatment to this new type of bacteria. Bacteriophages. These are a type of virus that can insert DNA into a specific bacteria. After inserting their DNA, the bacterial cell starts to produce more phages until the cell bursts open, killing it in a process known as lysis. Although it may seem somewhat counterintuitive to use viruses to treat bacteria, pitting two major pathogens against each other, bacteriophages cannot harm human cells, so are perfect for use in the body. What's more, even in the worrying scenario that a bacterium were to develop resistance to the phage, it loses its resistance to antibiotics. With the inevitable decline in the use of antibiotics, we have no choice but to study these marvellous assassins more carefully. Another unsung hero in the fight against antibiotic resistant bacteria is the media, which has placed a large part in increasing public awareness of the issue. I'd like to ask, how many of you have seen the NHS's advert about antibiotics and bi antibiotic resistant bacteria? The use of the medium of song has ingrained the message of not asking for antibiotics and minor illnesses into our minds. Due to increased awareness in the healthcare industry, antibiotics are now no longer issued for chest infections or child ear infections or sore throats. Despite these changes being small, they are our first steps to decreasing our dependence on antibiotics. Now, on sitting down earlier, some of you had red pieces of paper on your chairs. Could you stand up please? This is roughly 40% of this room. You represent the 40% of people who will die prematurely as a result of the antibiotics stopping working. It seems that bacteriophages and the media may be our only hopes of salvation, lest we are condemned to a world where bacterial infections plague our lives. Although, if we act together now, if we only use antibiotics when absolutely necessary, if we administer them properly, then we can reduce the pernicious effects of this silent killer. Because I know Duncan is joining us from home, I would just like to say a big thank you to Duncan for his interaction and for working really hard to make sure that he could participate virtually. I know it must be really difficult. Um, for those who know me, I cannot work my iPhone, nor do I know how to turn on my laptop. Um, so that must have been really challenging um, because I don't really think I know where even the cable for the mouse goes. Uh, I do just leave it plugged in. So we're now going to be handing over to Maddie 
who will be introducing her final West competitors. First of all, we have Akshita, who will be discussing superbugs, another topic that I'm really not familiar with. So I'm really excited to hear what Akshita has to share with you all. Over to you, Maddie. Hello everyone, so yes, you've got Akshita who is our first West competitor this afternoon. So I know Chloe's done quite an amazing introduction already, so I'll keep it short and sweet. But Akshita's been working really, really hard on her individual speech, which is on superbugs. It is really, really interesting and you will definitely learn a lot from it. So I will hand over to Akshita. What do you think of the word super? Superheroes, superstars, or perhaps even the Super Bowl? Well, what do you think about super bugs? Yes, indeed they have superpowers, but they're not exactly for helping the mankind. Did you know, in 2019, more than 1.2 million people died because of superbugs? Did you think COVID was the main killer? Then watch out. It's predicted that in 2050 onwards, 10 million people will die each year because of these bacterial infections. Superbugs originate from bacteria. Well, what is bacteria? Bacteria is present everywhere. It's on the things you touch, the things you eat, and you're probably covered in them right now. So potentially I'm talking to a room full of bacteria. <laughs> and the human body is the perfect example where bacteria live, as it provides the optimal conditions for multiplication that can cause you being ill. Just like us, bacteria have genes. We can say that bacteria one has just died leaving its genes in its host. Now bacteria 2 comes along and picks up those genes. We can clearly see that bacteria 2 not only possesses its own qualities, but also bacteria 1's. We can say that it has gained a superpower, and this could be the resistance to antibiotics. This is an example of a mutated strain and could potentially lead to the new emergence of a superbug. The role of an antibiotic is to kill bacteria. This could be a specific type or pathogens on a wider scale. For example, penicillin is used to treat cases of pneumonia, chest and throat infections. But is this still working? The number of mutated bacteria is increasing every single day and new antibiotics are made, which all prove ineffective. As you can see, the purple bacteria are slightly stronger and the turquoise bacteria are slightly weaker. With one dose of penicillin, we can get rid of the weaker bacteria, leaving the slightly strong ones left behind. After a few more doses of penicillin, the patient is feeling okay and the wound is nearly completely gone. However, we are left with one mutated bacterium. Over time, this one mutated bacterium can grow and lead to, into a more serious condition. An example of this killer would be the MRSA. Now, this is more harder to treat compared to other bacterial infections as it has become resistant to many widely used antibiotics, such as penicillin are redness, swelling, or pain in the infected skin, and can sometimes be accompanied with a fever. So how do we, tr how do we prevent this? Well, we can avoid skin-to-skin -skin contact, maintain good hygiene, and get early care. However, this still can grow into more life-threatening conditions such as sepsis and other bloodstream infections. 
The treatment for this includes 7 to 21 days of linozolid or active surveillance screening to spot traces of this bacterium. But this is still not enough. As 5,000 people in the UK die each year because of the MRSA. Acknowledging all of this, we can conclude that the key to preventing and controlling the spread of antibiotic resistant bacteria is an increased level of attention to environmental hygiene. In addition, this more stringent focus is needed not only in medical healthcare settings where these infections had most been common, but also in communal areas. It's pretty clear that we are not on a good road and this drug-based approach is not working. Can we ever stop the vicious cycle of producing new antibiotics to deal with these superbugs? Thank you. Thank you, Akshita. Before we came to London, I will be quite honest with you, I had no idea what a superbug was. Um, I did not, I did not know. So that was also very insightful. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Maddie uh, again to introduce Olivia. So Olivia is our final national finalist to take the stage today and she will be discussing the power of volunteering, which I think is close to many hearts within this room. We are all volunteers and we have all come together to celebrate our young people. But equally, we all take our volunteering lives and it's important that we share those with others. And we're really going back to that message of how you, as an individual, can speak up to save lives. So, Maddie. Thank you, Chloe. I feel like she's done most of my introduction already, but we've got our final speaker of the day, and this is Olivia from West Region. She's doing a really, really relevant speech on the power of volunteers. Hearing. Most of us here are volunteers or have done volunteering at some point in our lives. Hands up if you're a volunteer currently or have done volunteering. <coughs> Basically, the entire room. And Olivia's here to talk about the impacts it can have. We as an organisation have given over a million hours to the vaccination programme and I think that is an incredible, incredible achievement. And I know that many of the people here have been involved in it and I'm really glad that Olivia is highlighting this and it's something that she's really passionate about. So Olivia, I'll hand over to you. Have you heard the saying that not all heroes wear capes? Well, what does it mean? It could mean that our uniform would look a lot better with a bright green cape. <laughs> but more traditionally, it's used to shine a light on the often underappreciated helpers of society. Whether that be grocery deliverers, fun runners or vaccinators, every act counts. Every act makes a difference, and that's what volunteering is all about. I remember volunteering at my local care home, holding the hand of someone with dementia, helping alleviate their feelings of loneliness during the Christmas period. I remember the smile on their face as I wheeled them around the summer fair, and their curiosity as I shared with them the story of Diwali through dance. I remember feeling that unparalleled sense of reward. Volunteering has the power to change yourself. In one survey, 77% of volunteers agreed that volunteering helped improve their mental health and well-being. And that's because of that sense of reward. That sense of reward that comes from making someone feel emotionally or physically better. And that sense of belonging when you're working with your team members for one common goal in our green uniforms. <coughs> in all honesty, I chose to volunteer with St John because I want to study medicine in the future, which may not be the shiny, perfectly rehearsed answer you were all expecting. <laughs> but nonetheless, my experience so far has taught me a lot. 
Yes, I've learnt how to do a primary survey. And yes, I've learnt how to put a sling on somebody else. Just about. <laughs> but more than that, it's developed my confidence in working with new people. My confidence in reassuring patients. And my confidence to talk in front of you today. I believe that volunteering is about lifelong learning. You learn how to embrace challenges, support your colleagues, and really empathise with who you're helping. And every experience is a learning curve. During my duty at Cheltenham Racecourse, I helped to treat an elderly gentleman who had collapsed. And I learned how to actively listen. By nodding and asking questions, I was able to build a rapport with them and develop their trust in our team. That day, after treatment, we managed to put a smile on their face, a smile on their children's faces, and in truth, all of ours too. Volunteering has the power to change the wider community. Our drive is what inspires others to volunteer, and their drive is what inspires more people, and so on and so on and so on. Creating this positive feedback loop, or more simply, the butterfly effect. Even just chatting to a patient could help them smile, releasing endorphins that reduce pain and stress. Or helping out at one of the over 2,000 food banks in the UK, distributing vital supplies to those who need it most. Like children who rely on free school meals, to be happy and healthy. Or spending time at a homeless shelter, reassuring the 247,000 homeless people on the outskirts of society that they are appreciated, they are valued, and they are important. Now, I want to bring your attention to the clock. I want you to appreciate the 60 seconds in a minute and the 60 minutes in an hour. St John's Ambulance volunteers have given over 1 million hours of their time dedicated to helping people during the pandemic. That's 1 million hours of delivering the highest quality of clinical care and compassion. 1 million hours freeing up doctors' time so they can work where they are most needed one million hours so that nurses are able to take a breath. That's equivalent to 114 years, over a century's worth of time, supporting us get back to our new normal because of hardworking, selfless, loyal volunteers. In conclusion, Volunteering is life-changing, not just for yourself and your character, but all those people you are directly and indirectly helping. And volunteers are so much more than people helping out in their spare time. Don't you think they are our heroes on the front line? Thank you. So thank you, Olivia, for being our final person to come up to the stage, the podium, um, and share your hot take and your hot topic. I think we can all think of a topic that is very close to our hearts or something that really impacts us in our day-to-day -day lives. As Robbie said, we're all unique and there are all different sorts of lived experiences that come into our lives and impact the way that we behave and the way that we demonstrate the things that we are passionate for and the way that we communicate with others. We all here today are impacted by the heart values of St. John Ambulance. And I know I've mentioned these before today, but I think it's so important to share that we do serve humanity um, and that we do work together to create a community, not only internal to ourselves, but external to our locality. So, we now have a little bit more time for you to go around and discuss what you can do with other members of the audience. And we also have some time for the judges to deliberate and essentially come up with our final winners. Everyone here today is a winner. 
Everyone here today has worked so hard to be here and everyone here today had a brilliant time doing Just Dance in yesterday's workshop. <laughs> so I think it's fair to say that they've worked so, so hard and I would just like to ask you all to join us in another round of clicking and clapping for our competitors who have done such a fantastic job today.